The Great Wall of China is the only man-made structure clearly visible from the moon. It serpentines east and west for over 1,500 miles. For centuries, the Great Wall kept out the marauding invaders from the north. When the Mongols conquered China in the 13th century, Kublai Khan built a new capital city. He called it Da Du, the Great Capital. Today, it is known as Beijing. The city was carefully laid out according to cosmological and philosophical concepts of the ideal Chinese city. Its planners built the city on a north-south central axis. To the north, the gate of earthly peace. To the south, the gate of heavenly peace. The rulers built their palaces on the axis to achieve harmony between heaven and earth. Golden tiled roofs outline the imperial buildings of the forbidden city. It is a labyrinth of audience halls, private pavilions, secluded gardens and large courtyards. At the center was the emperor's throne, the seat of earthly power. The emperor was considered the son of heaven. In the days of the emperors, the forbidden city dominated the larger city that surrounded it. For hundreds of years, it was the emperor's exclusive domain. While gold was the emperor's color, the common man lived in gray-walled surroundings. His life was lived out in a maze of alleyways and single-story compounds that once stretched out in all directions from the forbidden city. These were the Hu Tongs, from the Mongolian term for a small alley. All are characterized by narrow, zigzag streets surrounding four-in-one housing compounds. Inside, four houses share a courtyard. Life is focused on the interior rather than the exterior world. Often hutungs are named for a physical shape or the trades practiced there, such as sesame, crescent, or trousers. The pace of living has been unchanged in hundreds of years. Many alleys are no wider than a single handcart. Blessings for peace and serenity can still be seen over traditional doorways which lead into courtyards. Hu Tong life is preferred by the Beijing old timers. In a sunny courtyard, a group of old men gather as they do each day. They've lived through the major peoples that have brought China from the last days of the empire through the war with Japan to the founding of the People's Republic. Zhang Ruiding introduces his friends. This old gentleman, he's 94. He even remembers the Boxer Rebellion. He's old Sui, 83 years old. His brother is 79. He was a farmer. I have five sons, two daughters. They all live here. How do I keep in good health? No bad habits. I don't drink or smoke. Each meal I eat a half a pound of rice. As we say, people are iron, but food is steel. After 1920, I was doing customer relations and sales work for a Beijing factory. And later, I worked as a cook in a nursery school. I've worked in the fields all my life. Why did I come to Beijing? When everybody went to the fields, I went with them. But I was all alone in the village. I couldn't cook and work by myself. As they say, I couldn't keep up with the wagon. That's why I came here. When I came to Beijing, I lost my food ration. I have to live with my son. As they say, I eat and drink, my son. My grandson was just this tall when I came here. 
Now he is 23 and is working. He doesn't need me to take care of him anymore. <laughs> That's my life story. I was born in the 24th year of the Emperor Kuang Xu. Of course, I never met the Emperor. How could it be possible? I've only seen actors play the Emperor in Peking Opera. In the old days, people like me could never come here. This was the forbidden city. Every morning, starting at 5 o'clock, the ministers assembled on the terraces according to their ranks. Flags and banners were lined up in a long procession. The emperor's music was played. When he arrived, the court performed the grand ritual. Nine times they would kowtow to the emperor. It was a moment of ultimate respect. To approach the Empress throne, you have to walk far and climb high, like coming to heaven. The dragon was the Empress symbol of power. In his sedan chair, he was carried over the dragons carved in marble. The Emperor was the son of heaven. The Hall of the Supreme Harmony is where the Emperor had his throne. It was the seat of earthly power, and high above were the heavenly pearls. The last Emperor to sit on the Dragon Throne was Po Yi, the baby Emperor. He was only two, but he was given a year from heaven, a year from earth, and a year from his ministers to make him five. His brother Puje is still alive. At first, I didn't know my brother was made the emperor. I imagined that the emperor must be an old man wearing a big crown and a big robe. To my surprise, emperor was a little boy just like me. We played together as children, but on far more occasions, we were required to be dignified and proper. My brother loved to ride bicycles. Many door sills were cut down so he could ride around freely in the palace. When the Dowager Empress Cixi and the Manchus were overthrown, my brother was allowed to live in the palace. About the time he was married, he was driven out of the palace. He died in 1967. To regain the throne, my brother believed that he had to establish his own forces. He sent us to Japan to study military affairs. It didn't change the course of history. Last year, I was appointed a representative of the People's Congress. We come from many different regions, races, and backgrounds. Yet, we have a tremendous feeling of solidarity. I used to feel, how should I put it, I was different from the others. Now I feel that I'm just a drop of water in the ocean, and deep inside, I'm glad. On the north-south axis of Beijing is Tiananmen Square, named for the Gate of Heavenly Peace, the southern entrance to the imperial city. From the top of its walls, the emperor's edicts were issued. 
After the founding of the People's Republic, many of the old imperial buildings were cleared away to make room for a vast open space five times larger than Moscow's Red Square. The square has become the site for political demonstrations and celebrations of all kinds, with crowds numbering in the millions. From the top of Tiananmen Gate, Chairman Mao proclaimed the founding of the People's Republic of China in 1949. Later, during the Cultural Revolution, millions of Red Guards gather here for mass rallies. At the base of the monument to the people's heroes, the April 5th incident took place. Supporters of the late Premier Zhou Anlai clashed with government security forces. It was the beginning of the end for the so-called Gang of Four. Today, the monument to the people's heroes is again quiet, and Tiananmen Square, the heart of China, has once more become a place for all her people to enjoy. early morning on the boulevard of perpetual peace. Here, there are no privately owned cars, so the bicycle is the answer to most transportation needs. In this city of seven million, the rush hour consists of two million bike riders on the move. Da Shilar, the big fence, an old shopping and entertainment district south of Tiananmen Square. The oldest silk store in Beijing is here. Herb medicines are sold in the oldest store of its kind. The original Peking Duck restaurant is here. And there's a public bath called the mouth of the fresh fish. A walk down Darshalar's narrow streets reveals much about the character of the natives of Beijing. Yo tail wrapped in crepes is a favorite snack of Beijing Muslims. After a long absence during the Cultural Revolution, photos of movie stars are again on sale. Darshalar is where the people of Beijing shop. Its atmosphere is like that of a carnival. <laughs> Wang Fujing, Beijing's Fifth Avenue. Once princely mansions lined the boulevards. The district caters to the many Chinese visitors and foreigners. 
Beijing's largest department store is here. Most of the natives come here to look at the latest consumer goods and Western fashions in the state-run shops. Chaoyang, the district facing the sun. Although new high-rises are solving an acute housing shortage, most people prefer the single-story four-in-one houses. The Yang family occupies the preferred south-facing unit in this compound. As cadre members, they also enjoy benefits such as home-delivered milk. Mrs. Yang holds an administrative job in a local food processing plant. In the family courtyard are three of the four generations who live here. I was a poor shepherd girl in Shandong province. I never went to school, not even one day. The old society prevented me from learning. They wouldn't even allow me to stand outside the classroom window and listen to the lessons. I joined the guerrillas fighting the Japanese. After liberation, I came to Beijing. When the Eighth Fruit Army came, I cooked for them. Granny was in charge of the women's brigade. There are scars on her back from Japanese bayonets. It is said everywhere rises new graves and every family weeps its kin. Mrs. Zhang's daughter was assigned to distant Taiyuan after college as part of the de-urbanization program. Caring for her daughter Lili was a great hardship, so Lili came to live with her grandmother. She can be away from her mother, but not from me. <laughs> Only a short distance from the Yang's home is the district market. Mrs. Yang and granddaughter Lili come early to shop. The Yangs have no refrigerator, so frequent shopping is the rule. Everything is state-run, from the farm to the market stall. Lines of buyers crowd the markets when seasonal foods are first available. To buy cooking oil, Mrs. Yang brings her own bottles. Here the shoppers bring their own containers. A light box is used to detect any bad eggs. Eggs are sold by the Jing, the Chinese pound, instead of by the dozen. Fish comes in frozen chunks hauled many miles from the ocean. In the dining room, the entire family makes the traditional jiaozi for the big new meal. Let me wrap a coxcomb. I can wrap several different designs. I have good spirits. From my appearance, you cannot tell what illnesses I have. In the socialist society, I am treated well. 
My illness does not weigh on my mind. I use soy sauce, sesame oil, scallions, pork, and vegetables. Then stir and stir. Add the vegetables last. This tray and that tray and the one in the kitchen. I wrap them all. My son graduated from high school in 1966, but at that time, the universities were closed, so he missed his chance. It was the terrible time of the Gang of Four. Today I am glad my children are in the new society, led by the Communist Party. Now we have rights. Our rights were not easily gained. My name is Liu Guozheng. I'm 59 this year. I have always liked sports. Air Force life helped me keep in shape. I've kept it up after retiring. I wake up every day around 5. Then I go to the neighborhood park. I jog a little and do a little Tai Chi. I run every morning about 15 minutes. The tiger style is a type of martial art. You imitate tiger. You act like tiger. You breathe like a tiger. Then you build your own strength. Lao <laughs> Huang, can't you make your bird come out and do some tricks? During the Cultural Revolution, we were not allowed to keep pets. Huang comes from very old Beijing family. Lao Beijing, we say. Keeping birds is part of our favorite pastime. After morning exercises, I like to come to this breakfast place run by neighborhood women. They serve yu tiao, costume bun, and soy milk. It's good and cheap. You got a lot to eat. Here, when you reach a certain age, you retire. Men at 60, women at 55. I got 90% of my salary and medical benefits, all paid by the government, just like while you are working. Many years ago, I lived in a four-in-one houses. Now I have a three-room apartment in a high-rise on the ground floor like before. I share a little garden with my neighbor, Mrs. Lee. This is my lover, my wife. This is my second daughter. This is my oldest daughter. And that's my youngest, my son. And that's my grandchild. Mrs. Liu, I understand yours was an arranged marriage. That was before liberation. In the olden days, marriage was generally arranged by the parents. That was the feudal marriage. But ours was a step ahead of the times. According to the custom, young couples were not allowed to meet before the ceremony. So you might get a big surprise on the wedding day. Although our marriage was arranged, they did let us have a peek at each other before the wedding. Did you talk to each other? Oh, no, it was not allowed in those days. 
But your arranged marriage has worked out for more than 30 years. It worked out just fine. What do you say, Mr. Liu? I totally agree with my wife. <laughs> Liu Jie, would you tell us how you met your husband? A friend of my mother introduced us. She thought the two of us would get along, so she mentioned it to my mother. Then we met and went together for about two years and gradually got to know each other more and more. Then we got married. I wanted a good quiet life without ups and downs. That's why I was looking for someone who was good and honest, reliable, a person with good qualities. As long as we communicate and the person is honest and reliable, that'll do, since I'm not particularly outstanding myself. Are you married? No, I'm not married. You know, in our country, young people, they marry late. People at my age are mostly single. So you're not worried about it? No, I'm not worried. Say, people at my age in the States, they're mostly married, aren't they? In the U.S.? Yeah, there are married people at your age, but many choose to live together first. <laughs> <laughs> That's not allowed here. I was an artist. Once I studied at the Beijing Art Institute, Later, I worked in a factory doing copper etchings. Mr. Wu Jingtang was my teacher. Here are some of my early works. These woodcuts I have done are easier than working on copper plate. With copper plates, you have to use a magnifying glass. With this, you don't. <laughs> this is called Mali Lamp in the Beijing dialect. It is a very hard root. I made a pipe out of it and carved the shrimp and the fish on it. There's another shrimp on the mouthpiece. I call it the lobster pipe. <laughs> Natives of Beijing we all like the Peking Opera. My father used to love it, so I cannot help but love it. I was an amateur player in almost every theater in Beijing. I played in the Battle Against Ma Chao, Village of Fierce Tiger, and Shending Mountain. I try to sing you a piece from Borrowing the East Wind. <laughs> Many Chinese call the Peking Opera the national opera of China. Originating from provincial operas, it was refined to a high art form. As in earlier Shakespearean drama, men played all the roles in the traditional Peking Opera. But the talent of this actor lifted the status of female roles to new heights. Mei Lan Fong pioneered in developing new plays featuring female leads. Playing many of these roles himself, Mei introduced new singing and dancing styles. He became one of the greatest stars in the centuries-old tradition of Peking opera. Mei died in 1961 but his children followed him onto the Peking Opera stage. 
his son became a top player of female roles, co-starring with his father at the age of 16. May's daughter, Bao Yue, later became one of the few female opera players to star in male roles. Madame May was a Peking opera star in her own right. She remembers a tragic period when the plays and roles of her husband were denounced. Mr. May knew over 400 plays, but they forbade this, forbade that. Only eight plays were allowed. Now my son is referred to as two play May. May's daughter, Law Du Zhen, recalls a time when he received honorary degrees and traveled in a company of international stars. If he met Charlie, Chap Mr. Chaplin, many times, I think. Uh, first time in Hollywood. In the year of 1929, he toured the States for more than six months. He, he had a very successful visit there. Today, the great plays pioneered by Mei Lanfang again are in the repertoire of the Peking Opera. For actress Liu Changyu, every performance of the Peking Opera is a special event. The makeup used identifies each character. I studied Peking opera for eight years. I mastered many roles, ladies, courtesans, and women warriors. Traditional opera requires lifting the eyebrows to make the arm and shape eyes. We use the belt to pull up the eyes and the forehead. If you're not used to it, you'll get a headache. That's one of the trials of doing opera. This hairpiece will help shape the face to the classic beauty. We call it the watermelon seed face. It takes several hours to get ready for the performance. In my hair, we put glittering jewels. This is called the diamond headdress. The tunic is usually worn for the role of the maids. Water Peddler is a transplanted opera. We adapted it from a Shanxi Pujo opera and set it to Peking opera music. It's about a clever maid who arranges a rendezvous between her mistress and her lover. A scholar forced by hard times to be a lowly water peddler. The maid amuses her mistress while she waits for her lover. She dances and sings about the flowers that blossom in each month of the year. The tardy water carrier finally arrives. The maid leads him to her mistress.
a happy play with a happy ending. For the young men and women of China, the days of arranged meetings and marriages are a thing of the past. Crowded housing conditions force them to meet in public, but they are still shy about showing their affection. They are the new generation of Chinese youth. From nursery school through college, the student population of China outnumbers the entire population of the United States. The pattern of schooling is set early. Most of the kids in this elementary school are destined for a bright future. Their school is one of the oldest key schools in Beijing. Many prominent figures began their education here. Mrs. Guan and her associate, Mrs. Zhao, teach here. Our second experimental primary school was established in the 1900s. In my 35 years, I've taught math the longest. Since December of 1977, our school was designated as a key or model school by the Ministry of Education. At that time, the school had been nearly destroyed by the Gang of Four. In order to restore the school, a decision was made to develop the curriculum. Last year, we re-established the academic admission system to select the best students. This type of specialized selective education was viewed as undermining the goals of socialism. Such schools were called elitist. Vast numbers of students with high academic potential were sent to work in the countryside. During the Cultural Revolution, political loyalty replaced academic achievement as the main criterion for acceptance into college. For more than 10 years, the Chinese system of education stagnated. Many claimed an entire generation of highly trained minds were lost. Since 1977, college entrance exams have been reinstated. Each spring, the attention of most high school students is focused on the tough exams. Only one in 20 will pass. For those who do, a bright future is assured. Are you satisfied with how you did on the exam today? It's hard to say. I'm sure there are others who did better. Many of the students already had a head start towards success with the exam. They were the select group who attended one of Beijing's key high schools. Mr. Chen is principal of one of these schools. The key schools are some 20 select schools where we maintain higher academic standards with superior faculty and students. Yang Xie was one of the students who lost out. At 15, he went to Inner Mongolia as part of the youth movement. Later, he received some technical education at a vocational school. They chose the so-called better workers as college students. Academic standing was not a consideration. I'm afraid college isn't possible for me now. This year's qualifications are for those under 28 and single. I'm married already, and besides, I have a child. Naturally, the country prefers younger people as college students. Well, in a few years, I'll be over 30 and too old. My brains are fried. I studied so hard. Pretty sure I didn't make it. For these two high school graduates, a college education may be an elusive goal. 
I'm just giving the exam a try this year. I'll try it again next year. As long as you're under 25, you're eligible to take it. I'm 18. I'm 19. But tell me, what happens if you failed the exam? Well, in that case, well, the country will assign a school to them. College-trained youth are the key to China's future. They are looked upon as leaders in the struggle to push China into the ranks of the developed countries in a program called the Four Modernizations. Zhuo Anze has just graduated from a key high school. His goal is to study theoretical physics in Beijing University, China's Harvard. Our country needs more highly trained technical personnel. My parents say this situation creates many problems in the factory where they work. Politics still play a key role in obtaining a college education. Xu Jie failed the college entrance exams the first time around, but political work in her factory job paid off with another chance. I did not give up. I felt I must try again. The building of our country needs our knowledge. If we are going to accomplish the four modernizations, science and technology must lead the way. I want to make my contribution in physics so that China will play a leading role. I want to be an excellent physicist. In your opinion, do you think there are enough universities in China today? I don't think this is what I need to know. These are the directives from above. Of course we don't have enough universities. Because China is a huge country, we need to increase the quantity and the quality of advanced learning. There are four modernizations. Agriculture, science, industry and defense can take off with high speed. Our intellect is needed for modern scientific knowledge, especially for young people. The future of the motherland relies on the youth. As Chairman Mao said, we are the 8 o'clock morning sun, so we must study hard to conquer the fortress of science. What's the major reason for the advanced state of science and technology in America? It seems to me that it's the people of the U.S., not the machines who make things really work. People are the answer. Then I'm confident that if our generation works hard, we'll catch up in the modernization of China.